Hey, welcome back to another week of Bible Study Fellowship. We're looking at the Gospel of John tonight. We're looking at John chapter 10, hearing about Jesus as the gate and the good shepherd. Let's open in prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for teaching us uh, about what the Messiah is like, what kind of Messiah you wanted to send to your people, what kind of shepherd you wanted to send to your people. Lord, as we look at John chapter 10, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the love, the support, the care, the security that you provide for your flock, for your people, through the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. I, I think one of the things that I've learned over the years about myself, and I think about humanity in general, at least in our current cultural moment, is that we're not great at waiting. It's not our strongest character trait. Uh, we're in an area of Amazon Prime where things can be delivered to our homes or our businesses uh, in shocking amounts of time, four hours overnight, uh, very quickly. Uh, when we order things from a fast food restaurant, we expect it to be delivered to us very quickly. Uh, overnight shipping, fast food appear to be the hallmarks of our era, maybe more than anything else. We love fast internet and fast cars and fast charging cell phones. We want things accomplished quickly. And uh, one of the things that we've just gone through, the season we've just gone through, is the season that maybe many young people or even many people who are older, like me, uh, have looked forward to with expectation, the season of Christmas. When I was a kid, I would spend a lot of time thinking about what is Christmas going to be like? What kind of presents will I get? Where will we go? Where will there be snow? Uh, what will it be like to be off of school? What will it be like to be around my family? What will be the way that I will be able to spend my time? And it seems, at least to me, when I was younger, the more time that I had to spend waiting, the more that I would develop expectations about what that event was going to be like. And, and uh, you know, the problem sometimes with expectations is that they're not always accurate. They don't always come to pass the way that we anticipate. And I think that's the great thing about McDonald's. No waiting, not much expectation about what the meal is going to be like. And unlike McDonald's, unlike the speed that we're used to of our modern lives, people spent millennia waiting for the Messiah. Uh, the Psalms are filled with people expressing their longing and their desire for the promised one of God to come and bring justice and rightness to the world. And there were great expectations that had developed over the years about the Messiah. What kind of person would it be? When would it happen? Who? What would it look like? What would our lives be like after this one who was promised from God, came. And uh, Charles Dickens played with this notion of failed expectations uh, in his novel called Great Expectations. And, and the main character in that book, Pip, had a belief about his expectations, what his life was going to be like, where his inheritance was from. And plot, you know, plot spoiler, uh, those things were wrong. And uh, the Pharisees, we see tonight in John 10, the Pharisees uh, say to Jesus, how long will you keep us in suspense? Are you the Messiah? And I believe those, those words were spoken from a true position of wondering and anticipating when will the Messiah come? And the challenge for you and for me and for all people is that Jesus is the Messiah that God intended. But he's not necessarily the Messiah that we expected. And so let's take a look at John 10 and begin to see uh, a little bit more about what kind of man Jesus is uh, who is sent to do the work of the Father. We, we came into this conversation in John 10 at an awkward time. If you remember from, from last time before the Christmas holiday, we looked at John 9. John 9 is the story of the man born blind. And John 10 
uh, at least the first 21 verses of it, are a continuation of that story. So the complete narrative of the man born blind begins in John 9, chapter, you know, John 9, verse 1, and extends through John 10, verses 1 through uh, 21. So it's our first section. We're going to look at this final portion of Jesus' teaching to the Pharisees of the healing of the man born blind. Chapter 9 ended with uh, Jesus finding the man, the man who he had healed, who had been cast out of the synagogue, uh, cast out of his family, cast out of his neighborhood. And uh, as Jesus is, is meeting this man, as Jesus is receiving worship from the man born blind, we see that there are still Pharisees that are there. Uh, the, the words... Um, uh, in, in verse 40, John chapter 9, verse 40, some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. And we're going to flow directly from that uh, beginning of Jesus' speech at the end of John 9, right into his continued dialogue with the Pharisees in John chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 21. That's our first division tonight, and our second division will be the second part of John 10, uh, which which is from a different time altogether. And so we'll look at those two parts of, of John 10 as we go through this passage tonight. Jesus begins uh, by uh, providing a metaphor that the people of the first century would have been familiar with about uh, animal husbandry as it pertained to sheep. And he talks about the way that you enter the sheepfold is by the door. Uh, If somebody climbs in or if an animal climbs in, that person is not the shepherd, but is a thief or a robber. The person who goes in by the door or goes in through the gate, as Jesus goes on, uh, is the shepherd of the sheep. There's a gatekeeper who uh, lets people in and out. And the sheep are familiar with the shepherd And the shepherd is familiar with the sheep. Uh, The sheep hear the voice of the shepherd and he will call them out. Maybe there would have been a word that he said to the sheep like Cush. Uh, We don't know. But there was some way that the shepherd would call with his voice and the sheep would follow him. And there are uh, pictures that you can find on the internet of of people who are modern day shepherds. And and they speak to the sheep and the sheep follow them around. They literally follow the shepherd wherever the shepherd goes. Uh, They won't follow a stranger. They'll, they'll be anxious. Sheep are prey animals. They're, they're used to being preyed on by, by predators. And so strangers, uh, things that they don't recognize will cause them to panic and scatter. And so sheep will flee from a stranger. Uh, and Jesus is using this figure of speech to, to teach a deeper meaning to his audience. Uh, and what Jesus uh, wants to, po- the point he wants to make sort of comes very quickly uh, in verse seven. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. Now, uh, first century sheepfolds were often enclosed by rock made walls, not maybe the fences and the barbed wire that we're used to today in, in modern day farms. Uh, But it's rock-enclosed walls that would have surrounded on all sides except for an opening that was maybe big enough for a man or or a woman to go through. Uh, And in that opening would stand the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper was as much of the gate as they were the door. And the gatekeeper would protect and watch the sheep in the pen when the shepherd wasn't there. And so uh, the gatekeeper was the only method that you could access the sheep. And if you climbed over the wall or came in some other way, you're obviously not uh, either a sheep or the shepherd. Your, your intent is otherwise. Um, and the point that Jesus is making as he refers to himself as the gate is that he's, the point he's making is that he is the only way to gain rightful admittance to the flock of God. Uh, whether you are sheep or otherwise, if you want to be a part of the flock of God, that pathway is through Jesus. Jesus makes the point that people in the past, people before him have come claiming to be the Messiah. There have been false messiahs that came before Jesus. Uh, there, you can read about them in history books. Uh, Josephus mentions many of them. Uh, but there, But Jesus is the true gate, the true Messiah, the only way that people are going to be able to access the flock of God. 
uh, Jesus makes the point that entering through him will bring about salvation. And Jesus' mission uh, in caring for the sheep is captured so clearly in verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is going to allow his flock to enter and exit, uh, to be brought into good pasture during the day, and to be in the safe and confined sheep pen, uh, safe from the animals and, the, and that would want to eat them uh, at night. Uh, and so we, we go on, and we, this sense of, of this fullness of life is what God intends for His people. Uh, it's what the sh- it's this the imagery is is for the sheep that they will have good pasture, that they will have protection, that they will have safety, and and that same is true for what for what Jesus intends for the sheep, the people that His Father gives to Him. He desires to give them protection and security so that they can experience the fullness of life that God intended. As we continue, Jesus goes on in his metaphor, and he goes on to say not just that he's the gate, but he goes on to offer two different examples of why he is the good shepherd. Uh, He says that, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so Jesus is making the point that he is the protector of the flock. Uh, He is willing to place himself in harm's way for those that would come and intend to do evil to the flock, whether it would be uh, a predator, a wolf, uh, or some other animal that would come, uh, Jesus is going to offer protection from the flock. He will not flee when that predator comes because he is the good shepherd. He is not the hired hand. Uh, He is willing and he will lay down his life for the flock. We also know, uh, we also see that Jesus is the good shepherd because he knows and is known by his sheep. Now, I don't know how long it takes in the real world for the shepherd and the sheep to develop a connection of trust. Um, But what Jesus is saying is, is that he has established a bond of trust with his people. He has their best interest in mind. He knows them. He knows your needs. He knows your concerns. He knows your anxieties. And Jesus is able to be known by all of his sheep, by all of the people who follow him. Jesus points out that he has one flock. He has, uh, he is the good shepherd and he has one flock and he will bring all uh, of his sheep together uh, underneath his single rule of authority. Jesus makes the point that he is going to willingly lay down his life for the flock. He has the authority to lay his life down, and he has the authority to pick his life up again because Jesus is here carrying out the works that God has for him. God's will, God's desire is for Jesus to do exactly what he is doing. He wants Jesus to be this kind of Messiah a Messiah that is the good shepherd, a Messiah that is the gate, a Messiah that protects and cares for and considers the life of the flock more important, more valuable than his own life. We see a similar response to Jesus' words among the people that heard them, and the result is again division. So we can see this in uh, uh, John 10, verse 19. There was again division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon. He is insane. Why listen to him? And others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? They're remembering the work that Jesus just did. And people are evaluating who Jesus is based upon his words and based upon his works, and they're coming to two very different conclusions. The principle for this first section is that Jesus leads his people as the good shepherd. Uh, Jesus leads his people as the good shepherd. When I was growing up and I would go on car trips with my family, uh, one of the things that you would always wonder is that when your mom and dad were planning this trip and you finally got to where you were going, what was it going to be like? 
you know, the, the, the usual experience for a kid is when you're in the car, you want to know, well, how long are we going to be in the car for? Are we there yet? Have we arrived yet? The car trip is not exciting. And, and, and the hope is that when you arrive at the place you're going to, that it'll be someplace that'll be interesting and exciting for a kid. And uh, there was nothing exciting about Aunt Dot's house. It was a long car ride, and Aunt Dot was like 87. And, and it wasn't a place where, where a, a seven- or eight-year-old kid could experience the abundant life. Not with Aunt Dot, not at Aunt Dot's house. And so there would be a, you know, don't hear what I'm not saying. My parents did a wonderful job raising me and my brother, but every place that we went wasn't always an exciting, glamorous, wonderful place for kids. We didn't always experience the abundant life at the end of our car trips. But what Jesus is saying to his people, what Jesus is saying is that I am the good shepherd. The places where I am leading you are good. They will be good. They will be good for you. And part of the reason that they'll be good is that I will be present with you. Jesus is leading his flock to places where it will flourish, where it will really live. My mom and dad didn't let me have as many McDonald's hamburgers as I wanted growing up because they knew that that would not lead me to the abundant life. And Jesus is caring for his flock. And David, the king, mentioned in the Old Testament, who wrote many psalms, one of the psalms that he wrote, famously Psalm 23, where he talks about his experience as a sheep of God. And there's parts of that, of that psalm that are wonderful, where David is being brought to green pastures and still waters, and the shepherd is present. And he also describes the places that he goes as being the valley of the shadow of death. And it sounds like a rough spot, a rough place to be. Yet David was not afraid because the shepherd was with him, leading him to the places where life would be abundant. Well, as you think about maybe how has your year gone? It's new, it's fresh, and hopefully there have been a lot of joys and a lot of victories uh, and a lot of ways that, that you've seen yourself carry out on your fresh New Year's resolutions. Um, and, and as you think about the victories that you've had, uh, what has it been like to have Jesus, the good shepherd, with you in those good times? Perhaps we're only a few days into the new year and you've already experienced some death valleys like David did. And what has it been like in the hard times to know that your shepherd is with you? Uh, That's the promise that the good shepherd makes, is that the good shepherd is with the sheep. The good shepherd knows what's going on with the sheep. The good shepherd knows where to lead the sheep to bring them to an abundant and full life. But it does sometimes feel like the valley of the shadow of death. But the promise that we have is that the Lord travels with us. He leads us as his flock. Uh, Perhaps you're not a part of Jesus's flock. Perhaps you feel alone, afraid, and isolated. Separate from uh, these, these sheep that are being referred to uh, in John's gospel and in my lecture. Uh, The good news for you who are lost, and for me when I get lost, is that Jesus looks for sheep that are lost as well. And the question is, are you willing to be found? Are you willing to be found and to become a part of the flock that Jesus tends? Are you willing to enter through the gate? Are you willing to follow the shepherd through the good places and the places that seem hard? as Jesus looks to bring you and me into the experience of shalom, the abundant life that God has for his people. Let's move on. Uh, Let's look at the last part of John 10, verses 22 through 42. Uh, This uh, occurs at the Feast of Dedication. Uh, Verse 22 tells us that at the time the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter. Uh, We might be more familiar with the term Hanukkah, uh, as the Feast of Dedication. So this would have been, you know, around, right before, several days, weeks before uh, we, we have Christmas is when the Jewish people would have celebrated Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. 
Uh, and Jesus is again in Jerusalem, and they're walking around the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. And the Jews are so anxious to know. They want to know, how long will you keep us in suspense? Are you the Messiah? We've been waiting for so long for the Messiah to come. We have so many expectations. And as the, as the Jews that were alive at that time surveyed the, the, the ministry that Jesus had and, and the way that, that Jesus' life began to be uh, borne out, they wondered and they, 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 they wrestled with the reality of that their expectations were not being met. Jesus wasn't the Messiah that they were looking for. And they wanted to know, are you the Messiah? And they were anxious. And they wanted answers. Uh, and Jesus points out, I've already answered you. I've already told you. And the problem is, is that you do not believe. Jesus explains that his proof, and we've seen this numerous times throughout the Gospel of John, the proof of who he is, is found, at least in part, in the works that Jesus is doing. The works that the Father prepared for him to do. Uh, Remember, uh, right before Jesus healed the man born blind, John 9, verse 4, Jesus said, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Jesus has been carrying out the Father's plan of of his earthly ministry. The blind man who received sight was one of many miracles that Jesus did. Uh, And so Jesus has been performing miraculous signs, teaching in miraculous ways, And this evidence has been clearly visible to the Pharisees and the Jews who acknowledged that they were cited at the end of of chapter 9. And they do not believe. They do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, they, They are not among those that Jesus counts as his sheep. Uh, The Pharisees, the Jews hear his voice, and they, they don't know that he's their shepherd. And uh, we get some other information uh, about uh, the sheep that Jesus has. Number one, Jesus points out that his sheep have eternal life. They will never perish. Uh, number two, Jesus points out that his sheep are held in his hand. No one will be able to snatch those sheep out. Number three, uh, we learn that Jesus' sheep were given to him by his father. And and it sort of begs the question, John doesn't lay this out for us, but what do the non-Jesus sheep have? Well, none of those three things, certainly. Uh, and so conversely, we can uh, think or, or, or hypothesize that they will perish. And uh, the New Testament speaks of the second death as being this notion of outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, The the non-Jesus flock will be snatched. They'll be be exposed to predators. Uh, They'll be easy prey for uh, the wild, the wolves, those who would destroy and kill. Um, As Jesus is explaining the relationship between the Father and himself, he makes the statement that I and the Father are one, uh, John chapter 10, verse 30. And as followers of Jesus began to meditate and think about uh, Jesus' words as they read the Gospel of John and other things, they, they wanted to wrestle through this notion of what Jesus is implying with I and the Father are one. Uh, there's this this conflicting problem is that the Bible clearly teaches that the Lord our God is one. But yet clearly, as we've uh, heard Jesus teach, as we've seen him, it, it, it seems that there are three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, this verse and others like it have, have come to define the doctrine of the Trinity, that, that, that mysterious reality 
if we could plumb the depths of God and understand them, we would see that God is one. He is united. But yet, inside of the Godhead, there are three distinct persons that we can identify as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, as Jesus makes this claim, uh, the Jewish people pick up stones. The book of Leviticus allowed stoning for uh, sp- uh, specific blasphemy. Uh, it was mentioned in Leviticus 24, 16. And uh, Jesus asked the question as they're about to stone him, uh, I have shown you many good works of the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews point out, well, it's because you, a mere man, declared that you're like God. We get what is a, a, a complicated section in uh, John 10. I will try to outline this a little bit for you. Uh, Jesus responds, it is, is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father consecrated, Jesus himself, and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God? Uh, This is a reference, uh, I said you are gods, to Psalm 82, a psalm of Asaph. And uh, Asaph was reflecting upon, uh, in his cultural moment, the position of the nation of Israel. They were recipients of the law. They were called to be a nation of priests, a source of blessing to the world. And yet, at the same time, in Asaph's time, there seemed to be injustice that was being carried out by the nation of Israel. And the specific injustice, one of the specific injustices that is mentioned, is the care of widows and orphans. Uh, And Asaph uh, calls, you know, the, the people who had received this law, Asaph refers to as gods, the little g, little g gods, uh, not meaning that, that, they were, that they were deities, but that they were God's designated nation, God's designated people. And uh, if these small g gods were acting unjustly, by the, by the treatment of widows and orphans, Asaph's lament was, when was the big G God going to come and bring justice? Throughout the Old Testament, uh, this, this, this call to the people of Israel to care for widows and orphans uh, happens again and again and again. Uh, twice in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 10.18 and 24.16, indicate that the nation of Israel was responsible for caring for widows and orphans. Exodus 22 This is the command that God gives to the nation of Israel. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused. I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. It's it's, these verses about caring for widows and orphans were given to the nation, the people of Israel. And Asaph was saying that that privileged position is, is as if they are gods because God has imparted wisdom and direction uh, and, and correct ways of living to them. And the people at Asaph's time weren't doing this. And he lamented that as he wrote his psalm. Uh, and, and so in the same way, this is a great verse, a great section for Jesus to quote because that same problem was happening in, in his day. The leaders of the people, the knowledgeable people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law were self-interested, self-motivated, self-seeking. They were not interested in caring for the widow and the orphan. And instead, they were more interested in creating a, a culture where if anyone acknowledged Jesus as a teacher, as, as, a, as a, a prophet, as a leader, would be cast out of the synagogue. They were blocking the way of the people, the common people, the blind, the poor, from accessing and experiencing Jesus. And so this is a great passage for Jesus to point to uh, and offer evidence that use of the word God, this notion of being in God's family, this notion of God the Father, is not one that's new to Scripture. Uh, And Jesus goes on to point out that the critical issue for the Pharisees 
is to consider the works that God has sent Jesus to do. What do you say about the works that I have done? And the Pharisees pick up stones again to kill Jesus, but he escapes their hands and he retreats across the Jordan. And we see there people that have listened to the testimony, the witness of John the Baptist, and people who have seen the works of Jesus and perhaps heard about the works of Jesus are believing Jesus there, the insignificant, the people that are outside of the city of Jerusalem are the ones who are believing that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus' works prove that he is the Messiah. Uh, one of the things that, that we wrestle with uh, in our culture is what do we believe? How do we come to believe things? When you and I drink a can of soda, or eat manufactured foods, there's a list of ingredients on the side. And it tells us what's inside this food. Uh, Maybe it has sugar or flour or preservatives. Um, The reality that we have to grapple with is how do we know that the information on the side of the can is accurate and true? If you're allergic to peanuts and peanuts aren't listed on the side of the drink, if you believe it, you'll drink it. And and we are faced with information all the time uh, that we have to evaluate and assess and decide, will we act upon this information, upon this ingredient, upon this email, upon this information that we read? um, How... Do we know that the information that we're acting on is true, is valid, is real? Jesus offered proof of who he was based upon the works that were visible to the Pharisees and to the people that were alive with him. And the eyewitnesses to Jesus' events did not all believe that he was the Messiah. And I think it's one of the mysterious aspects about following Jesus, about God, the God who made the universe, who made cells and atoms and quarks and nucleuses and DNA and giant things like stars and whales. The sovereign Lord of the universe has given us the ability to choose. And somehow our choices matter. We've seen people in Jesus' day who were eyewitnesses to the events that he did choose to believe. The disciples, the people that Jesus was with across the Jordan. And we've seen other people who have seen the same Jesus, seen the same activities, seen the same miracles, refuse to believe the people that John refers to as the Jews. And we have the same choice to make today. We haven't seen Jesus' miracles with our own eyes, but John presents this information to us. And it brings us to a point of wondering, what do we believe? Do we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that God sent, who can take away our sins and bring us into his flock, and bring us into a right relationship with God? Or do we choose to reject the information that Jesus has offered through the pages of John's gospel? What will your choice be? Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the words of Jesus. Thank you for John and his willingness to capture uh, these events and share them with us. He had no idea that we were going to be able to read his words, but thank you, Lord, for bringing them to us. Uh, I ask, Father, as we wrestle with the question of who is Jesus and will we believe him, that you would help us, uh, that you would help us understand, that you would answer our questions in ways that maybe we don't expect. Uh, But I pray, Father, that you would direct us and let us see and evaluate what is true, what is false, and help us to choose the life that is offered in Jesus. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.